Welcome to the workshop of the European Road Maintenance Forum. My name is Carsten Karcher, I'm the Secretary General of the European Asphalt Pavement Association and together with my colleague Juan Jose Potti from ASEFMA, the Spanish Asphalt Producers Association, I will lead you through the program today. Today we celebrate the 7th the International <laughs> Road Maintenance Day. In Europe we do this in a workshop, but all around the globe other related events also take place today. Let me show you today's program because it has been changed in a little bit. So we simply moved block one to block two, so the, the, the second session is now the first session. We have some trouble issues and that's the reason why we shifted it a bit. In between the two blocks we will have a break and we will start with a short introduction by my colleague Juan Jose to introduce you the International Road Maintenance Day and what was the idea to create it in the year 2018, what is the background and uh, we would like to learn more about this idea that you, that you had so many <laughs> years ago. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kasten. I am happy today, very happy. I am very proud, very proud to confirm an uh, idea talking with uh, Siobhan, I remember it was in 2018, that right? And it was exactly during the PPRS made in Nice uh, seven years ago. That means we are, this is the seventh celebration of the International Road Maintenance Day. And that show the idea, and I will explain which is the idea. The idea was maintained on time. The idea is to use this hashtag IRMD in the year, in our case today is 2024, and to show, to give arguments to show the importance of the maintenance of roads under the point of view of the emission of the cars. The most important arguments to defend the importance of the maintenance of the roads normally are based on comfort and security. But evidently it's not enough because the majority of the countries in Europe we have a problem in the last years, decreasing of the, of the budget. And it was the idea uh, to add a new argument based on environmental questions, the emission of the cars. Today is a special day, as Carsten uh, explained, is the first time we made the European Road Maintenance Forum in Europe, in, here in Brussels. This idea is not original of me, this is an idea was the first time was last year from our friends from South Africa. South Africa made a team to create together and to defend together this idea. Arguments to defend the importance of the preventive maintenance of the roads to reduce the emission of the cars. And I repeat first time Use please today the hashtag, both hashtag IRMD2024 and ERMF2024, both today. At this moment, see, yes, yeah. you see on the screen. <coughs> At this moment, we are received in the last hours more than 500 tweets. Only Twitter. We can add LinkedIn, we can add Instagram, we can add a lot of uh, media, but we overpass at this moment more than 3 million impressions and we are connected today more than 40 countries on streaming seeing this event. It's thanks to all the people uh, aiding sharing with us this, this, this goal. Repeat, the goal is to show, to give arguments and today we will talk about emissions linked to maintenance of the roads, a very important argument on my, under my point of view. I wish to finish and I will do giving three examples, three examples based on the, in my opinion, the most important thing. In the, in the case of ASEVMA, for example, we defend on the past, ASEVMA reinforcing the road, consolidating the future. It's a good way to show the importance of the, of the rehabilitation. But we change. We change because 
our focus actually is ASEFMA reducing emissions. We put in the first level emissions, reinforcing the road. Opposite. Another example, let me show a very, in my opinion, interesting example. Preventive, preventive road maintenance can be a very important argument to reduce the emission of the European Union. We are a very able actor to reduce the total emissions, more than 25 or around 25 of the total emission of the Euro European Union come from the transport. Evidently, we can act on the infrastructure to reduce the emission of the vehicles. Second argument, and, or, or third, I don't know. We should make an emission map of the roads associated with the roads, the association map associated with the roads. Even more, we can, my proposal is a emission reduction map, seeing the capacity from our activity to be able to reduce the total emission of the, of the, of the in Europe. And finally, road rehabilitation projects, in my opinion, should we call it emission reduction projects. Is my final, and I repeat, to finish, please use the hashtag IRMD2024 and ERM2024. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Jose, for this, for this, uh, this opening words and for the, for the information about the International Road Maintenance Day. So it's international, and you mentioned it. We had red registrations last night from over 46 countries all over the world. So this is really impressive, and yeah. thanks to the online possibilities, <laughs> we can manage this. We would never have had so many people in Brussels in an, in an, in an, in an auditorium. So that's great. Uh, you can also use the, the chat box in, on YouTube if you, wanna have a, if, if you have a question, if you would have a question to the speakers, to us, so please use that. Uh, you mentioned the road maintenance forum that was created in South, um, South Africa just two or three years ago. We will hear from that later because we have the yeah. CEO of the uh, South African Association giving us some more insights. And maybe this also leads at the end of the day exactly. to some activities for us in Europe, how we can even be stronger on the International Road Maintenance Day with a European Road Maintenance Forum. And the topic of, of maintenance is really a important topic, you mentioned it, and we will have this throughout the day, we will develop it, it, it throughout the day, but also not only on this special day things happen, we had just recently, a few weeks ago in the European Parliament, Check an it. event um, that was infrastructure maintenance and the decarbonisation challenge. You, you, you were one of the panellists yeah. in the European yeah. Parliament, and that was, uh, was uh, organised by some industry uh, associations, and at that meeting, the DG MOVE, which is the is Director General MOVE, which is, so to say, the European Ministry of Transport. And this ministry, they announced that they will provide a, 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 that they will provide a report. I have a... I'm sorry, <laughs> so I missed to show the slides. So this is the, <laughs> this is the, this is the website or the homepage of the uh, International Road Maintenance Day. So you will find more information here. I'm sorry, I missed that one when Juan Jose spoke about it. Yeah. And this was the event in the European Parliament. On the left-hand side, so you can see Juan Jose. And, yeah, and then was a, they, the, 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 let's say, the European Ministry of Transport, they announced that they will provide a, a document, a report, on decarbonisation of transport infrastructure construction. And we were really, really curious. It was released yesterday. Yesterday, because, as you might not know, this week we have the Connecting Europe Days. Mm -hmm. So I was just there this morning and yesterday and some of the colleagues also to discuss about the transport itself in, uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, it's a very, very uh, big event. And the report was released and we had a look at it, of course. We were curious what is about the maintenance and so, but it's, maintenance is still not really a topic. Yeah. It's only construction. And they were talking about mainly procurement, design and construction. And to be clear, it's quite vague what they have inside. It's good ideas that are not really new, for at least for our industry. So it's good that we have, related to the Connection Europe Days, today our event, the International Road Maintenance exactly. Day, and that we sit here together to give more insights on this. 
And, but there's one sentence I want, to, I want to put some emphasis on. It's the operations and maintenance phase that was very, in a small paragraph, mentioned. And they mentioned proactive maintenance practices, which is something we hear more about today, and digitalization. And this brings me directly to the first speakers of the day, when we talk about using data, digitalization of data. So we are really happy to have two Spanish colleagues here with us. We have Camino, he's, uh, she, sorry, Camino, she's from SAIT. She will explain you personally what does mean and what she's doing in her everyday life. And also we have Jose Carlos Valencantos, and he's from the company Shuba, and he might also say some words how, uh, about his company. He's the CEO of this company. So, Camino and Jose Carlos, the floor is yours. I will give you my microphone. Excellent, thank you. So, because you will both speak. Together. Can I have the? And now let's have a look. So we have the names again. And okay. Here we go. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> what? Well, good afternoon, and um, thank you very much to ASEFMA and IAPA for inviting us to participate in the first edition of the European Road Maintenance Forum on the occasion of this 4th April 2024 that, as all you know, uh, is since 2018 the International Road Maintenance Day. I'm pleased to be here at the IAPA office in Brussels today. But above all, it's a pleasure to share with you the project that we are developing in my company, which is first experience to evaluate reduction of road transport emissions before and after a paving activity through a road condition monitoring with floating vehicle data. This project it's been elaborated with the collaboration of the University, uh, Polytechnic University of Valencia, the company Shova, and of course, with the valuable assistance of ASEFMA. My name is Camino Arce Blanco. I'm civil engineer, and after 14 years working in the Ministry of Transport, I am currently the technical and business development manager in SAIT, a state-owned public company set up in 2005 by the Minister of Transport. Today, I would like to present you very briefly my company, its road network and investment plan, and of course the project we are working on and we are very proud of, the idea, the experience and the objective. SAIT is a state-owned public company created in 2005 in the Ministry of Transport. With the signing of the management agreement of 2017 and its addendum of 2018, the Ministry of Transport assigned to SAIT the management of the operation of nine highways whose concessionary companies had been declared bankrupt years before. In February 2019, SAIT became the Spanish Toll Road Maintenance Company with the largest number of kilometers and its responsibility with a total of 700 kilometers. SAIT is in charge of the operation management of nine toll highways, 14 associated free motorways, 25 service areas, and we are 540 people. Most of these highways are located around Madrid, three of them reach Castilla-La Mancha, <coughs> and the two sections of the AP7 are located in Murcia and Alicante. The management agreement signed in December 2022 regulates the management of the highways for a period of 10 years and 7 years more, which is a very positive scenario which will allow this company to develop a powerful investment plan seeking an optimum state of our road network. Thus, in SAGE, we have foreseen an investment plan of 370 million for the four following years, of which uh, 218 are sorry, are in pavements. This investment plan can't forget such important aspect as sustainability and linked with the concept of sustainability and with the need to explain that road infrastructure is viable, the most extended, permeable and open to the public 24-7 and with the good fortune to having met the ASEFMA Association and the company Shova, the project that we have come here today to explain was born. Well, as you know, ASEFMA has launched initiatives such as the International Road Maintenance Day, 
as, as Karsten has said, today we celebrate the seventh year, focus on demonstrating the importance of preventive road maintenance in reducing emissions of the vehicles. And the EMIPATH project <coughs> that tries to find a way to quantify the emissions generated by vehicles and the relationship with the state of road maintenance. Both initiatives aim to achieve climate neutrality on roads and to relate the road surface conditions to the level of emissions generated by the vehicles driving on them. In addition, Ashefma in Spain has promoted the environmental declaration of bituminous mixture in Spain so that this can be an initial value from which to start improving. One of the state's objective is to restore the pavement of its road network, its entire road network, to their optimum condition and SAID must look for the sustainability in its action. SAID's decision cannot directly impact on the composition of the fleet and have a limited effect on the traffic congestion. But what we can do is to provide the most efficient pavement strategies to minimize the emissions of our users. And in our, in, in our red no, road network, we have the M50 highway. The M50 is a free motorway and the outermost ring road of Madrid and its metropolitan area. Oops, sorry. The M50 is a highway of uh, 85 kilometers long and has an open horseshoe shaped to the north, running at an average distance from the Madrid from the city center of 13 kilometers. It reached an average daily traffic of 100,000 vehicles. And we have planned to invest 73 million euros in pavement. So here is a unique opportunity to measure vehicle emissions before and after a pavement activity to finally draw a clear conclusion on the impact of the road surface condition on green greenhouse gas emission. And we are not going to miss it. As I said before, SEP has launched a study in collaboration with the University of Valencia, the company Shova and ASEFMA, whose characteristics will be explained by our colleague Jose Carlos Valdecantos in the following slides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Camino. Thank you, Karsten, for the opportunity to be here. I want to explain a little bit more, a bit deeper into the project. Um, when Juan Jose and Camino reached out to me, uh, to work in this project, I was a bit surprised at the beginning because our company does a lot of analysis with connected vehicle data, which basically is the data coming from a lot of the sensors that are installed in, in modern cars. And normally when we work for road authorities, we, we are asked for a, obviously for the condition of the road is a very common question, but as well things like, I don't know, the speeds, obviously the harsh braking, the cornering, potholes, uh, traffic signs, things like that. No. Uh, we had never, not before, uh, have worked with uh, fuel consumption data or emission data. Uh, it, it wasn't. I think it was. It, 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 it hasn't hasn't been till till today um, something that within their policies of the road authorities they are paving the road because the road is in bad state and they have more traffic. They want to 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 fix the road. Uh, in this case, Camino said, "No, we want to pave the road because our road has to be greener. It has to be." more uh, sustainable and it has to, we have to defend our, our actions uh, from that, that point of view. So um, obviously it's in common, make common sense that um, a better road uh, causes less emission or the, the less consumption of fuel, uh, but how deep can we measure that? Up till now, uh, all the studies that you can see are based on estimations. What are, this, what are the composition of the fleet that drives through the road and what is the, the fuel consumption of that uh, each kind of vehicle. No? Uh, but we can source now information very detailed of the road. In this case, we have different uh, kinds of, of data sources. No? The first data source that we use most is the traffic data. Um, Camino here has a very good, or the SAID has very good relationship with the DGT, the traffic uh, department in Spain coming from the Ministry of Interior and they were kind enough or, 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 or diligent enough to install some cameras with the li license plate recognition and they have the database of the type of vehicle uh, corresponding to each uh, license plate so we have a, a very clear uh, a very precise fleet composition this is not an estimation we have cameras and every day we have between 40,000 and 10,000 depending on the on the milepost on the on the chainage uh, and we have 
Uh, except for the foreign cars, which we don't know the depth of when it's a foreign car, but we do have to pay, we do count them. But we have the, uh, the, the, the weights, the type of vehicle. In, in many cases, we have Euro, Euro 5, Euro 6. We, we have that information. No? Um, then we have as well uh, the speeds. Obviously, the emissions has a big correlation with the, with the speeds and with the congestion. More congestion, more emissions. Uh, as you can see, we have some suppliers for the speeds. We have use Indrix, we will, uh, Google traffic. Um, and for the emissions, we use Webfleet. Webfleet, they give us um, data for the fuel consumption between the different waypoints the different the, the, in the trajectory of the cars, how the car is consuming the, the fuel. And for the roughness, which is here's what, what we want to prove. The, it's a before and after study, and the variable that we're checking before and after is the pavement uh, condition, in this case, the roughness. No? Uh, you can have a guess, looking at this, at this screen, which are the kilometers that they are going to... Obviously, red is bad, green is good. <laughs> uh, so you can imagine that the, the, the millions they mentioned that they are going to be placed in, the red, in, the, in those red uh, parts. No? From a technical point of view, uh, it's not complicated study from, from a data science point of view uh, because there's three or four different data sources. We have to make an effort of, for the conflation to, to, to match the hectometers. But this, we have two great suppliers, both Nira and Webfleet, produce excellent data. Uh, and it's fantastic. And from our point of view of the analysis, it's not a, a complicated part. We do have the before now. Now they need to pave the, the road. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what we're doing. And we're very happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, these insights. Very, very promising, I would say. And it leads me directly to the first question, if I'm allowed to, say, to raise a question. Um, is it difficult to get the data? Because you mentioned several data suppliers, and is this Ka difficult? What, what car do you drive, Carsten? Uh, I'm driving a Mercedes. What year? What year? Oh, old one. It's a... 11 years old, I would say. Uh, well, if you, if you have a newer car, I'm sure you, I, I drive an Skoda myself. I have my, my Skoda app in my phone. No, no app. You don't have one. No, no. Okay, That's then the, the car is able to collect some data. Your car has 300 sensors. A Mercedes, a new Mercedes, an AQS can have 350 sensors. Those cars are collecting information. Now, which information are they collecting? Uh, the position of the window, not so much. Not Something that's really valuable, especially for, for, for fleet, for trucks, is the, the fuel consumption. Because any fleet manager wants to know the efficiency is important, no? So it's not hard. The roughness, getting roughness from Nira is, uh, it's, I think, it's one of their best products in their portfolio. And, and from Webfleet, the fuel is, is, we have a quite big penetration of data. So of all those 40,000 vehicles that drive through, we have a lot of them, a big percentage of them, uh, data for, for them. Are you aware of, of, uh, of other? Uh, suppliers doing something similar in different in other countries. I'm I'm quite sure that you are the first one to do it like. This. No, I don't think so. I I, I think I've heard uh, from people in in the UK of doing similar. They ha that I have not seen being published, and informally they were give because one thing that worries us is okay we're going to do a before and after. What what if there is no effect? No something that uh, we are we be, obviously it makes sense that it that it will uh, lower the consumption. But the, the informal information that we have, is they, they're doing similar things in the UK. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the, from the panel? Do you have questions? Or the two of you? have one. I, yes. have, I, I, have, I have. No, I know. I have it's not. Or a comment. My comment will be, uh, <coughs> you, you, you talk, Jose Carlos, about the data. Data only. Data uh, obtained. Each day, that obtained by the cars. I, I, you, you, you heard probably this argument uh, used by Jose Miguel Baena on the next presentation. In my opinion, not is not only to obtain the data. The most important thing, in my opinion, in the case of the data from the vehicles, you are able to see the evolution of the data. Sometimes, sometimes we have uh, uh, a rule. Uh, on the, on, the, on the projects, seeing the, the final result of the evenings, IRE or satellite this is less than this value. But we don't have, really, in Europe, in the world, we don't have a real evol evolution of this data on time, mm. according to the traffic. Mm -hmm. And you have, we have now, thanks to this technology, the capacity to see not only the data, see the evolution, the derivative, the evolution on time, 
And but for me, it's the most important thing. Not only to estimate, not only to have a, only one picture. See the evolution and have all the information to act preventive to reduce this, this value. It's, a, it's, a, it's only our one remark, but I consider it very important. Yeah, and you have you have the uh, real time data, so to say. Exactly. Yes, from, yes. it's, it's from not yesterday. every two years with a measuring campaign with no. some some evenness measurement. So no, from the day before, normally in case of the roughnesses, you have two roads have a similar roughness. This has three and three, but this last month had three point two, uh, so, so two point ten is going up. Uh, this is a static. Mm. So the, having the trends, what he means is exactly this is a new. I think it's a game changer. Yeah, very good. Okay, thank you again. Thank you. So this, uh, this brings us to the next speaker. It's a similar, similar uh, idea, a similar field. And the speaker is Jose Miguel Baena. He can unfortunately not be with us today. So we have a pre-recorded uh, video from him. Um, he is the general manager on, ma on, on road maintenance in the city of Madrid. So he, give us, he will give us the, the insight of, of a local authority. I already have received a question uh, on local authorities on this. Maybe this will answer this presentation. The title of his presentation will be Use of Big Data from Cars to Obtain an Indicator of the Level of Maintenance, the example of the city of Madrid. Una serie de indicadores que nos liberan a nosotros, a las ciudades, que no tienen nada que ver con las carreteras, eh, nos interesaba hacerlo. Eh, los indicadores también debían de servir también eh, un poco para definir, ya no solo a nivel de calle, pero sí nosotros a nivel de barrio, distrito, porque después tenemos que pensar un poco eh, a nivel ciudad en que haya eh, una... Una, una, una armonización un poco a, a, en el, en el, a nivel de estado de los pavimentos y que haya y que todas todo, digamos todas las zonas de Madrid tengan tengan una, una situación más o menos similar un reequilibrio territorial digamos que en la ciudad es importante y, y aquí lo tenemos que tener en cuenta lo que hicimos desarrollar sobre una base GIS porque era más cómoda para nosotros porque todos los datos los trabajamos sobre una base GIS y nosotros además lo podemos completar además la base GIS de Madrid eh, del propio ayuntamiento es muy activa tenemos os lo recomiendo, o sea, es del Geoportal del Ayuntamiento de Madrid, tiene muchísimos datos de todo, lo estamos metiendo todo ahí, incluso la operación asfalto la metemos ahí eh, y seguimiento en tiempo real de, lo, de cómo va y demás, y, pero tenemos, claro, tenemos datos de todo que podemos cruzar. Yo esto lo podía cruzar, eh, el inventario lo puedo cruzar con los avisos de los ciudadanos, a ver dónde se detectan más avisos, lo puedo cruzar con otra serie de actuaciones municipales, que es absolutamente necesario, lo puedo cruzar con las licencias, lo puedo cruzar, es decir, si no es imposible gestionar, porque es que en cada metro cuadrado de Madrid están actuando a lo mejor 50 contratas, eh, del arbolado de, del canal de la segunda, no sé qué, la licencia de Iberdola, eh, están los de limpieza limpiando, están los de, o sea, es tremendo. Entonces, gestionar todo eso es complicado. Y, bueno, empezamos en base a inspecciones visuales, porque nos pareció que para empezar era lo mejor, aunque tardamos después, tardamos bastante tiempo. Ahora mismo ya estamos en otra línea, ya, ya, estamos, ya estamos ahora haciendo un piloto un poco para calibrar otra, otra búsqueda de, de otros datos. ¿no? Estamos trabajando con varias empresas eh, para hacerlo en base a fotografías, que hay empresas que se dedican a eso, en Barcelona lo hacen y tal. Eh, eh, en base a, a otros, con un móvil, pues va detectando, eh, pues con una cámara va detectando inteligencia artificial o, eh, el inventario. Y lo que más me interesa a mí es ahora utilizar los sensores de los vehículos. Eh, estoy un poco sesionado con eso, pero a eso voy porque es que creo que es es el gran cambio que va, que, va, que va a suponer en el futuro, el gran cambio va a ser la utilización de los sensores de vehículos. Entonces, estamos trabajando en ello porque, claro, eh, los vehículos eh, auto, auto, ahora automato, eh, están tan automatizados, digamos, lo de la, lo de la, 
lo de la planta es de risa al lado de, cómo, de los sensores que tienen los vehículos y ahora mismo muchas empresas, por ejemplo Mercedes, te da todos los datos que tú quieras libremente, ya lo cobrará, ya lo cobrará. Otras cobran, Volkswagen, el otro. Entonces, eh, eh, estamos trabajando mmm, porque todos los sensores nos, nos dan una cantidad de información increíble, increíble. Y a los firmes también nos sirven, para movilidad ni os cuento, pero nos sirven para todo. Es que ahora mismo le estamos viendo, oye, pues mira, como tenéis sensores de luz, porque se encienden o se apaga lo, lo, los, la, la luz de los vehículos, pues incluso detecto zonas de la ciudad donde hay falta luz, eh, de calzada, etc. Bueno, me sirve para todo. Bueno, como los vehículos tienen la posibilidad de más... Eh, de detectarte un bache porque corrige la amortiguación, pues te manda un aviso. Y además te puede hacer una foto con, con, el, con, el, con, con, con la cámara de, de, de la parcar. Te hace una foto, pum, y es que tengo el bache, o sea, tengo todo. Bueno, esa es por donde vamos ahora, ¿no? Es un poco. Y entonces, además es que nosotros ya lo hemos detectado, pues se analiza con bastante facilidad. Hay una empresa que lo hace, no voy a dar publicidad, pero bueno, si alguno está interesado. Y. Y entonces nos permite decir, me ha dicho, bueno, a ver, ¿qué, qué, ¿qué calles has asfaltado la semana pasada a que te lo digo? Vale, dímelo. Me lo dice y me dice esta, esta y esta. Y efectivamente son las que hemos asfaltado. ¿Cómo lo ha detectado? Bueno, porque la gran, el gran cambio que supone los datos de los vehículos con respecto a lo que hacíamos nosotros antes en el CEDES, que es, sensoriz es o sea, eh, sensorizar la carretera en la pista de ensayos, que yo he llevado un tiempo y tal, el, el, el gran cambio es que te da datos en tiempo real. O sea, vosotros no lo sabéis, pero os cortan la cola y el de salida y entrada de, de, de vuestros vehículos, pero el resto lo está mandando sin que vosotros lo sepáis. Continuamente estáis mandando datos. Con lo cual, yo tengo el dato en tiempo real. Y no tengo el dato, tengo la evolución. O sea, tengo la derivada. Tengo hacia dónde vamos. O sea, no tengo el deterioro. Tengo si el deterioro va aumentando o no. Lo cual es lo último, porque es, 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 es ya la, la, la capacidad predictiva. ¿Dónde va a tener...? O sea, yo teníamos, teníamos hemos arreglado el puente de Raimundo Fernández de Villaverde, pues se estaba, se estaba bajando la entrada al, al puente, tenía un, unos asientos, y eso es que lo detectaba, lo, lo detectaba increíblemente, porque claro, iba viendo, ahí detecta, según, según vas avanzando, va detectando que eh, en el tiempo... ¿Cómo va acelerándose el deterioro? Con lo cual, incluso antes de que ocurra, ya sabes que se está acelerando. Con lo cual, puedes actuar. Bueno, eso es, nos, nos está cambiando la forma de pensar y, y a muchas administraciones, que, que voy a echar lo que hace así, seguramente se la habrán presentado y, y es que es increíble. O sea, va a ir por ahí los, los tiros. Seguro. Bueno, eh, bueno, habla de, de indicadores sencillos. De momento estamos en lo que estamos. Entonces, hicimos un piloto en Chamberí donde, donde lo que hicimos fue pues, inspeccionar todas las calles, todos los... Primero, inspeccionar todas las calles y, eh, y, y en base a eso, pues, pues ver un poco por dónde andamos, porque lo, lo, lo que tenemos que hacer es calibrar. Un poco nosotros planteábamos unas plantillas de inspección en base... Eh, lo, lo primero que tenemos que hacer era tramificar, que era muy difícil en Madrid, pero tramificamos también las intersecciones por un lado y tal, y dividir los tramos de las calles es, es complicadísimo, porque cada calle de una manera es bueno, en fin. Conseguimos tramificarlo todo, la superficie de las calles, etcétera, y ya con la inspección, pues, dábamos una, mirábamos una serie de cuestiones, fisuración, baches, tal, la gravedad de los mismos, en función de su tamaño, etcétera, una serie de cuestiones, y ya, pues, nada, nos pusimos a calibrar, que era lo complicado, para poder establecer unos niveles que, al final, tenían que ser sencillos, de, uno a, de, de cero a cinco. Y aquí tenéis los niveles, pues, bueno, un nivel cuatro y cinco, pues, no requiere una, una actuación inmediata, pero ya teníamos el nivel cinco recién asfaltado, y después nivel cuatro, pues, algún desperfecto puntual sin, tra sin trascendencia, etcétera. El nivel tres... Seguimiento preventivo, no requiere actuación inmediata, pues signos de inicio de envejecimiento y demás. Nivel 2, 1 y 0 ya requiere actuación. Reparaciones localizadas en nivel 2, desperfectos numerosos. En nivel 1, reparaciones numerosas, desperfectos numerosos con riesgo, etc. ¿no? También metíamos el tema del riesgo para, para, la, para la seguridad vial, etc. Bueno, con todos esos datos pues ya conseguimos plantearnos, bueno, tenemos nivel de 1 uno, de uno a 5, ya vamos a empezar a, a trabajar sobre la ciudad. Tengo que sacar un contrato un año, para porque además, claro, ya hacíamos aceras, asfalto y accesibilidad, o sea, hicimos todo, que era quizás lo más complicado, porque ya aprovechamos, claro, el viaje de uno allí mirando para ver todas las cosas, claro. Y bueno, tenemos ya un panorama de la ciudad, ya, bueno, pues ahora nos podemos poner a trabajar para hacer, eh, para, para un planteamiento de un, de un plan de choque en condiciones, ¿no? Entonces, bueno, pues nos, nos pusimos a trabajar. En ese momento, ya en paralelo, ya ya, ya nos dimos cuenta de que el contrato integral se nos quedaba corto. 
Porque, claro, nosotros, nosotros para andar bien tenemos que, tendríamos normalmente que estar entre 150.000 y 200.000 toneladas al año para estar bien. Claro, tenemos un déficit brutal. Entonces, eh, bueno, pues, pero claro, en aquel momento, pues bueno, empezamos a pedir dinero, salía dinerillo de ahí de unas cosas que se llamaban IFES, es inversiones financieramente sostenibles, que básicamente era que te dejaban gastar en el año eh, excedentes que tuvieras siempre que no generaran, que no fueran obras que generaran eh, más gasto. O sea, no podías hacer una biblioteca que te genera más gasto de conservación. Pero si asfalto era ideal. Bueno, pues venga, nos dieron asfalto y empezamos a meter ahí muchísima más obra para, para un poco complementar lo que veníamos e ir mejorando cosas porque no... Pero bueno, lo íbamos haciendo sobre el inventario básico y, 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 y sin grandes datos hasta que tuvimos ya el inventario nuestro, que seguramente fue en 2017, 2018, que, que terminamos de calibrarlo. Ahí ya pues eh, estábamos eh, haciendo ya unos... Eh, llegamos en torno a mil, un millón, un millón y medio metros cuadrados al año hasta que llegó 2019 y ahí, ahora os lo cuento después, fue un poco el cambio porque ahí ya sí empezamos a utilizar el inventario para ir eh, a tener en cuenta el reclivio territorial y aquellas calles que tenían peor puntuación eh, para revertir la situación. ¿no? También tenemos en cuenta, obviamente, los diarios principales, eh, que son, eh, pues en Madrid tenemos unos diarios, la red estructurante que llamamos, son vías principales, o de la ciudad, de los distritos, etcétera, y después la red local, ¿no? Y la red estructurante pues tenía mayor importancia, ¿no? Bueno, en aquel entonces ya, ¿qué hicimos? Pues en base a toda esa... Bueno, después de calibrarlo 27 veces, porque esto no, no dábamos con la tecla, llegábamos allí, no, esto no, es que no, pues esto no, esto no, tal. Y, y hasta que ya entró la calibración, digamos, en, en su... Eh, eh, se hizo adecuada, vamos, a, a, la, a lo que veíamos, pues eh, ya tuvimos, ya pudimos sacar unos índices por distrito, que al final básicamente es de cada, cada tramo de calle, que la tenemos súper tramificada, cada tramo de calle, eh, pues ponderadamente con su superficie, pues al final hacíamos una ponderación global entre la superficie global del distrito eh, de cada tramo y sacamos una nota del distrito. Entonces ya teníamos una nota de cada distrito. Ya detectamos, oye, pues mira, hay distritos ciudad lineal, tenemos que meter dinero, tenemos que meter dinero aquí, 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 tal, y algunos están mejor, algunos están peor. Nuestro objetivo era que todas las calles, o sea, todos los distritos estuvieran por encima de cuatro. O sea, que, que estuvieran bien en general. Está hablando de valores medios, es decir, siempre hay algunas calles que se nos han quedado mal, pero eh, de momento, por supuesto, todo lo que estuviera en 0, 1 y 2, eso lo hicimos de golpe, claro. Ya después lo que pasa es que hay muchos treses y, y, y eso se va a compensar. Ahí teníamos una nota media de ciudad de 3,59, ¿vale? En el 2019. Entonces, metemos la primera operación asfalto 2020. Hacemos una operación asfalto importante. Casi 800 calles, 3,8 millones de metros cuadrados, 60 millones de euros... Eh, de 60 millones de euros, digo de la época. Lo digo de la época porque yo he sido el único, y me estoy arrepintiendo, que me tica su té. Y ahora no sé cuánto voy a tener que pagar. O sea, de momento, este año 6 millones y todavía no, no he contado el del 22. Cuando meta el del 22, no sé cuánto va a ser. Es decir, que estos valores, cuando le meta el caso usted, van a ser otros. Pero bueno, para mi desgracia. Pero bueno, eh, yo creo que había que hacerlo porque es que era evidente que no podíamos bajar más. Eso va a ser un problema eh, sí o sí. Bueno, metemos la primera operación a Fato, que ya fue impactante, porque, claro, empezamos, son muchísimas calles en todos, en todos los distritos, y ya pues, pues conseguimos ya revertir la situación. Ya subimos a un 3,86, íbamos mejorando todos los distritos y, y, y vamos atacando donde, donde, donde lo necesitábamos, ¿no? Así planteamos. Con todo esto, claro, con toda, con toda esa información ya se pueden plantear este, este nivel de, de operaciones de asfalto, porque si no sería imposible, es que es brutal, la estáis, la estáis sufriendo vosotros todos los días, claro, es, 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 pero, es, pero solo para detectar dónde tienes que hacer las inversiones. Entonces, planteamos la segunda, que fue igual, o más, más. Fue más porque, porque eh, siempre quieren que sea más. <risa> Eso está bien. Eh, mientras hay dinero, cuando no hay dinero ya puede ser menos. Pero... De momento metimos 905 calles, otra vez otros 62 millones, otra operación asfalto de impacto. Y ya subimos a 414. Lo que pasa es que todavía tenía algunos distritos que no alcanzaban tres, eh, están por encima de cuatro y tal. Y eh, planteamos pues, la última operación asfalto, que es la que estamos acabando ahora, que es la que estáis sufriendo en la puerta, porque todavía estamos esta semana con la lluvia, no, no pudimos terminar, que pretendíamos que terminar. Y metemos la de este año. 
que es otra vez pues, otro montón de calles, impactante. Además, en realidad hemos hecho más, además, porque aquí no cuento las de conservación, que hemos hecho otras 100, o sea que, que probablemente estemos en las 1.200 casi calles, teniendo en cuenta que Madrid tiene 3.000 calles, 9.000 calles, perdón. Y en total en estos tres años hemos hecho un tercio, más o menos, de, toda, de todo Madrid, que no está mal. Pero claro, atacando donde, donde estaba peor, con lo cual, con lo, cual eh, lo que tenemos a continuación ya, después de estos tres años, es 4,36 de media en Madrid y todos los distritos por encima de 4 de media, lo cual era el objetivo que teníamos. Esto ha sido una pasada, hacer esto, ha sido una pasada. Claro, eh, hay que tener apoyo, que tengo que dar las gracias de luego a mi concejal, a Paloma García Romero, porque y al equipo de gobierno que nos ha apoyado siempre en revertir la situación que teníamos. Eso es fundamental y, y la implicación de, de, la, de, de, bueno, de los que gobiernan la ciudad para que esto se revierta y, y consigamos tener una ciudad o dejar una ciudad ahora mismo. Al final del mandato es una situación buena, para ya para mantener unas condiciones más normales, ¿no? Claro, cuando juntas todas las operaciones de asfalto, pues es que yo no sé, es que es, que es brutal, no es una maraña de calles tremenda. Entonces, eh, pues tenemos eso, ya os digo que con la, con la de conservación llegaremos a 3.000 calles y un tercio, do, pues 12 millones de metros cuadrados asfaltados, eh, un tercio de la ciudad prácticamente, y los 185 se convertirán en 200 millones de euros, que no está nada mal, en tres años. Claro, la, 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 el inventario cuando pasó, pues claro, pasó de estar... Eh, anaranjado, amarillo, anaranjado a, a estar casi verde eh, porque claro, ahora tenemos una situación que, que es absolutamente estupenda esto por ejemplo, casitas <coughs> un ejemplo de una calle pues nada, pues en 2019 teníamos esta situación y, y en, 2000, en 2022 tenemos esta hemos asfaltado prácticamente todas las calles claro. eh, nos falta una que creo que fue por un tema del, del canal <coughs> Ya un poco para acabar, eh, es un poco el planteamiento de lo que teníamos. Esto es la primera diapositiva que os he puesto. Esto es el, el año sin asfalto, con dato integral, como eh, hicimos el primer plan de choque, y este sería el segundo de este año. So thank, thank you to Jose Miguel Baena for this presentation. Uh, this was, the, was based on, the, on, on, on local authorities or the view of local authorities by the example of the city of Madrid. Uh, we have some comments from, from Juan Jose related to the specialities, what you have to consider and what is the difficulties if you do this in a, in a, uh, in a local road authority. Well, I know very well because I, I, born, I was born in Madrid, I live in Madrid, I know very well, and I know evidently Jose Miguel Baena also. And uh, during the conference he showed, he, he explained us uh, a procedure based again in the data from the vehicles, able to give us a very important thing, in my opinion. It's an indicator, an independent indicator, indicator from the car with a criteria to elect, to select which is the road, which is the avenue, which is the most adequate to establish, for example, a program of the paving in a, in a, in a city. Evidently, it's not easy. Imagine the, a big city. I, I always explained during the 50th anniversary of uh, ASEPMA, uh, IAPA, excuse me, and ASEPMA also. Um, Madrid is the second town in terms of population in the European Union. You see the number of avenues, the number of... It's, it's, it's crazy. And do you have, thanks to this data, a very easy... A acceptable and dependent way to have an indicator able to give you, for example, objective. All the avenues in Madrid must be at level four, at level three. This is uh, it could be simple, but for me, it's very important thing to have a KPI, a system to establish a value, a criteria to obtain yeah. a, a, a goal. To have an indicator which, exactly. which shows the development exactly. over the years or over months, maybe even. Exactly. Because it's difficult to measure the IRI in locally. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I see. Okay. So for me, Madrid has the best roads in the city. <laughs> I'm always happy to see that. 
being a, know, coming from the European Asphalt Pavement <laughs> Association that the asphalt looks so good in uh, as a, is in such a good condition in Madrid. And you are welcome yeah. always. Yeah. So we. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. So we. So we, we. We talked a lot about vehicle data, and from sensors coming from the vehicles. So I'm happy to have someone from the association that is more or less. Uh, no, it's not responsible for the cars, but it's handling the the, the, the cars, or its 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 task is to to uh, to uh, to take care of the of the vehicles, and it's the uh, the European um, Automobile Manufacturers Association. I'm sorry, it's a long word. So it's ASEA, and I'm happy to have Thomas Fabian with us. He's not. I don't think he's really in the sensor technology and so on. No, he's, 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 he's the chief commercial vehicle manager. So he takes care of the, the buses, the trucks, everything above 3.5 tons, so, which is the most important part of the transport on the roads for the infrastructure. And he will, he will show us a little bit a different view on this, a different point of view how to what what how what could ma influence maintenance in the future with new transport and uh, i'm happy to have you here because we have always a very good collaboration from the asphalt industry and from the automobile manufacturers uh, uh, industry or association and yeah so i would like to give you the floor to give you this this di little bit different view and then we will have a, a round table afterwards to discuss it a bit the floor is yours thank you very much thank you very much Carsten. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, when you asked me to, um, uh, if I could be available for this, um, oops, uh, for, <laughs> could be available for this, um, thank you, uh, for this presentation, then um, I was, uh, you mentioned that I should um, give you uh, a bit of an insight of what our thinking is um, with respect to the decarbonizing, um, decarbonization of road transport. And as you mentioned, my um, a uh, particular focus is the commercial vehicle industry, so um, heavy-duty vehicles. And I'm happy to give you an overview, and I think I have a, a couple of good news uh, and perhaps a couple of uh, more challenging, challenging news for, uh, for, for, the, for you. Um, at the same time, I will also conclude with I, which, uh, what, what I hope will be a, um, uh, like a, a consensual uh, perspective uh, on how we need to address these things. So let me dive into this. Um, um, there is no question that um, we need to decarbonize transport. <laughs> so um, decarbonizing heavy duty road transport in particular is a particular challenge um, because of the, um, uh, the, the, the many emissions that come from CO2, greenhouse gas emissions that stem from this sector, but at the same time, um, it is also a what we call a hard to abate sector. So that means um, heavy duty road transport is is a commercial, is a B two B market. So here, um, uh, running a truck um, has to make sense, right? I, I sometimes we sometimes joke that no one in their right mind is um, actually running a truck just for fun, uh, or even owns a truck just for fun. It has to make sense. And there's usually two questions that uh, transport operators ask. First one is, can the vehicle do the job? Can, can I do what I, need to, uh, what I want to do with the vehicle? Can it do this, uh, fulfill this job? And the second question is, um, can I actually earn money with this? Um, so is it a, a viable business um, that I can run with these vehicles? Now, decarbonizing road transport um, in our, from our perspective requires three factors. And in the end, it's a relatively simple equation, we would say. Uh, one is, of course, it requires the vehicles. Um, we have 120 something years of history of diesel trucks on the road, diesel trucks and buses. Um, um, the, the v in order to move away from those, to cut the emissions from those, uh, we need to, in, to find a way to um, have um, um, uh, fossil-free vehicles um, uh, or vehicles that are running on fossil-free energy carriers. And we need um, these energy carriers. So that could be electric vehicles in our view. It could also be hydrogen-powered vehicles or other um, source energy sources. Um, but to the extent, and that's why I highlighted this in red here, to the extent that these new energy carriers actually require infrastructure, charging and refueling infrastructure, no one will invest in a vehicle, in a battery electric truck, for example, without being sure that they can actually operate the vehicle. That's why charging and refueling infrastructure must be in place. And the third uh, element um, is not the focus of today, but it is an important factor not to be missed here. Um, 
it's what we um, summarize under the carbon pricing framework. So, as I said, um, two questions. Can the vehicle do the job? And can it do, so, can it do the job in a viable way? So can, can I earn money running the vehicle? Um, and um, if, I, if a transport operator is, keep, uh, is generating, is making money, profits with the old vehicles, but not so much with the new ones, then no fleet renewal. No one will invest in a new vehicle. So we need to create conditions where investing in the new vehicles is, is more viable, more interesting, and accelerates fleet renewal. So in our view, um, and we already discussed this with the manufacturers a um, uh, couple of years ago, 2020, today we have a situation where we have about 96, 97 percent of all new registrations and almost all of the fleet um, fossil powered by fossil diesel. Um, uh, combustion engines, and it's very clear that uh, we need to move away from uh, these um, from these to zero emission technologies, and that is largely the battery electric technologies uh, and uh, hydrogen powered, which could be um, uh, hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles, but also including hydrogen combustion engine vehicles. The question, and this is a bit the uncertainty that you see here in this uh, this S curve. The question is how fast is this transition going to happen? Again, coming back to what I said earlier, if the conditions are in place, if the, um, the transport operators can say, I can operate the vehicle, and actually I can earn more money running the new vehicles than the conventional ones, everybody in their right mind would switch, would want to have one of the, the new ones. So this transition can happen relatively quickly, um, but it depends on factors outside our control. It depends on, fact, on enabling conditions. And when and exactly these enabling conditions will be in place, will it be 2029, 2032, 2034? Who knows? We don't. So um, that's why we need to actively work and prepare um, uh, and encourage everyone involved, other stakeholders, um, to create with us these enabling conditions. Now, the bad news for us, in a, in a, in a sense, perhaps, is that we have very severe, very strict targets um, for vehicle manufacturers by when exactly, 2030 in this case, the emissions of the new fleet, the new registered fleet, will have to be lower by a certain percentage um, uh, than compared to, the, um, to a baseline, 2020, 20, 2019, 2020 baseline. And um, it's not yet final, but it's in the final stages of being adopted. And, uh, the institutions have agreed on a 45% reduction target in 2030. Now, 45% the, the emissions of the newly registered fleet will have to be at least 45% lower than in 2019, 2020. Now, this translates, of course, this will not happen overnight in 2029. Uh, this will be a, a transition, a ramp up phase. And this translates into about 400,000 zero emission heavy duty trucks in operation by 2030. That's five and a half years from now. Um, today we have a market share in 2023 20, of about one and a half percent of zero emission vehicle, heavy duty vehicles. We need to be at about a third in 2030. Five and a half years from now. <laughs> so. We also have a good idea of what it means in terms of, um, of infrastructure needed. Um, so uh, you see this is a, a slide where we um, uh, made the calculations what would be required in terms of charging and hydrogen refueling infrastructure for a 40% 40, 40 reduction target and for a 50% reduction target. So you can just um, uh, take the average here. For a 45% reduction target, we need about 400,000 zero emission vehicles in operation. And another 100,000, roughly, uh, will have to be registered every year thereafter. These vehicles will require about 50,000 publicly accessible, suitable truck chargers, 50,000. And out of those, we will probably need 35,000, which will be capable of megawatt charging. So um, in order to uh, ensure the, the operation of these vehicles. And on top of this, we probably need somewhere between 700 and 2,000 hydrogen refueling stations across the Union. And these are only the publicly accessible um, chargers that we need. We assume that everyone who buys, who invests in, an, in a battery electric truck, for example, will want to have a depot charger at home. So 400,000 vehicles, that 
equals probably 400,000 um, depot chargers on top of these uh, publicly accessible. Today, I mean, the 1.5% the market share that we have today uh, of the new registrations, um, they are being operated somewhere. They're being uh, charged somewhere. So we're not exactly at zero uh, in terms of charging infrastructure, but we're very close to zero at the moment. And we need, we have five and a half years. Now, um, some of the um, perhaps more challenging news here. Um, we have um, vehicles today, um, the diesel trucks, or uh, it's not uncommon for them to have a, a diesel tank um, which is capable of um, uh, powering the vehicle for 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers range. This is not what we will see for battery electric vehicles. We will most likely um, have to have the charging infrastructure in place so that the vehicles can be recharged every four and a half hours, which is exactly the, um, the driving and resting time uh, regulation. So whenever the vehicle has to stop anyway, we need to be able to charge it, to top up or recharge it fully within the break, 45 minutes. Um, and that, will, that means we will have for the majority of the vehicles um, a, um, a, uh, an operating range uh, and a battery capacity that is probably enough if it allows a four and a half hours driving range. Bad news is these vehicles will most likely permanently be um, heavier, four tons. Mm. So, and um, if we, this seems like a, a difficult um, uh, um, overview here, but if you just look at the, uh, at the table at the bottom, if um, uh, we have two challenges here in the current regulatory framework, weights and dimensions framework, um, that is, one is the total vehicle weight, uh, and the other one is the, the axle weight, the maximum axle weight, which is currently limited at 11 and a half tons. If we get the additional um, uh, four tons um, to avoid any payload penalties, again, transport operators will want to operate the vehicles just as they are used to, as they are used to uh, with the conventional vehicles. So if we assume we get the, uh, the, these additional four tons to um, compensate the actual um, bad powertrain weight, but we stick with the current maximum um, axle weight of 11 and a half ton, that means we have a, a payload reduction of about one and a half to two tons, which is not an issue for many operators, but an issue for some. So, and again, we have a very short time to um, uh, convince a large number of operators to invest in the new vehicles. If, on the other hand, if we um, only have, um, if we're not getting the additional um, uh, four tons to compensate fully for the powertrain weight, but only get two tons, um, then um, we would have a, a payload um, uh, penalty, if you want, about of about three tons or so. So the message, the key message is, we need to adjust the um, the weights and dimensions framework yeah. because under the current uh, framework the transition to zero emission vehicles will actually require more zero emission trucks than to carry the same payload than uh, conventional trucks mm -hmm. so and these additional trucks will obviously require additional chargers and more hydrogen refueling infrastructure they will require more energy they will consume more energy they will require additional parking space, of which we already have very limit, little. Um, they will contribute to road congestion uh, on top of this. They will require more drivers, and we have a, driver sh a growing driver shortage. And they will obviously also increase road wear. Now, the, the, the message is that I would like to send here is the good news that if we find a way um, uh, adjusting the, the weight distribution within the vehicle, moving weight from the, from the um, uh, drive axle to the front axle to an extent, um, then uh, we, um, uh, or actually the other way around, move it from the, um, uh, uh, so increase the axle weight by one ton um, and thus, um, and thus um, redistribute uh, the inner, uh, the, the, the vehicle, the, the distribution of the weight within the vehicle, that will actually allow us to um, mitigate the road infrastructure impact. So, um, my conclusion here is, um, and that is the, um, perhaps the, uh, for the discussion also, 
So decarbonizing heavy duty road transport is possible. Um, solutions are on the table. Uh, it is a clearly a joint effort uh, that requires and has to involve many, many stakeholders. Vehicle manufacturers, obviously, we are the ones being regulated in many cases, but also transport operators need to be enabled and encouraged to invest in these vehicles and to operate them. Hauliers, shippers, everyone needs to, logistic providers, and everyone needs to be incentivized to use these vehicles. Um, Road um, uh, and charging and view free fueling infrastructure providers and operators, um, and many, many others. So the agreed timelines, especially here in Europe, are extremely challenging. Five and a half years again for the first target. Um, uh, but it's also clear that this transition will not happen overnight. So uh, just because we have, we will have to have uh, roughly 400,000 zero emission trucks on the road by 2030, doesn't mean that all of the fleet by 2030 suddenly would be four tons heavier and would have an additional extra ton of uh, axle weight. There is a bit of a transition. But the, the, the message I would also like to send here is that um, hard choices have to be made. There's no doubt that we need to decarbonize road transport and that many, many stakeholders need to change what they're doing now. They need to, we, we, all of us, we need to do things differently. So that also means that infrastructure investments are needed, uh, massive infrastructure investments in the charging and refueling infrastructure, but also where necessary, upgrading the infrastructure to cope over a medium term with higher vehicle weights and higher axle weights. So this is why we're, I'm so grateful for the, uh, for the invitation and for the continuous co uh, collaboration here because close collaboration between the associations but of course more importantly um, crucial between the, um, the companies um, doing this actually is key to meet um, our joint decarbonization targets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Well, that was great. Yeah. Maybe we, we share the microphone together Please. when we talk now. So there's a, I made a lot of notes, so there's a lot, lot to, to speak about in the, in the next minutes all together. So thank you for the presentation. Well, <laughs> yeah, so there will, be, there will be some challenges for all of us. And uh, what, one thing that directly comes to my mind is uh, decarbonize, decarbonize, decarbonizing our society is a multi-stakeholder approach. Yes. It's not, that, not the silo thinking, it's doing it together. And when I listened carefully to the Connection Europe days, the last two days, there was DG Move, DG Grow, DG Fit, DG FISMA, etc., and all this taxonomy that comes with it. Silo thinking is over. We have to do it together. It's a joint effort, and you had it on your slide. So this is something that is really important. Um, one, and and the, the message for today is that uh, more heavy vehicles will have a higher road wear, will bring a higher uh, uh, road wear, and that means more investment and more in maintenance is needed. Mm -hmm. So this is the message coming from Absolutely. very natural thinking or very clear thinking what this means when we decarbonize road transport. Mm -hmm. So this is another challenge we have on top, and we have yeah. a lot of challenges when it comes to road maintenance. So we would need extra investments in this in this sense. So and I maybe maybe for those who might not be really into this, 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 this topic, if you increase the axle load with one ton or two tons per axle, that does not mean, that's not a linear behavior. That does not mean that the road deterioration is the same percentage. No, it's exponential. Mm -hmm. So the deterioration of the road is much higher. So if you simply say, Absolutely. we increase the, the, the load of the axle from 10 to 11.5, what happened many, many years ago, and now from 11.5 to, let's say, 12.5, it's not just 10% more, it's maybe 40 or 50% more of the, the, the impact on the, the, the inner strength of the pavement. Absolutely. So we need much more uh, investment than only 10% more. And it's just a regulation, a new regulation, which brings us to decarbonize the road transport. And this is the consequence out of it. That has to be clear to everyone. We have to do it together. It's a multi-stakeholder approach, and then the road industry is also involved, has to be involved. Not only the infrastructure for the loading and for the, for the charging, also this. And one of our colleagues in one of these uh, events that we just recently has man had managed, uh, mentioned that 
Um, everything that we do on the road now to decarbonize road transport leads somewhere to more wear of the road. So this was one example, but we have also other examples, which is also related to the to the to the to the um, um, to the trucks themselves, because the electric vehicle has a different friction and a different shear force on the surface of the of the of the pavement. So that's another thing. And if we want to load during standing or rolling with inductive loading systems, you have to put something in the in the asphalt layer or in the concrete layer. You have to put something in the in the pavement, which is again maybe more uh, not not so durable. So this is another point which which brings us to decarbonization and makes makes uh, life easier, maybe for the transport on it, but not for the infrastructure itself. So we have to be careful what we do. We know we have to do it. There's no no alternative. It's clear, but we have to think it. Not, we cannot do it in silo thinking. We have to do it all together, and also the road sector has to be included, and that's the reason why we are here, the International Road Maintenance Day. So just from my side, so please, any comments are welcome. You, yeah. you, you, you want to start? Please. Please. I, I, am, I, agree, I agree with, uh, first thing, congratulations, uh, excellent presentation. You give, me, you give us uh, extra arguments or extra points to, to see the challenge, your challenge. And um, I agree with several comments made by my Carsten. I, I am very happy you are here, uh, ASEA. I, I feel sometimes the, the world in the, of the infrastructure of the roads work isolated in terms of the cars. And we are, evidently, we are, we are a couple. We, are, uh, we, we, we work together, and uh, I think I think you 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 promote in the last years uh, a hashtag reducing together. I see, especially on this time, a time very difficult. The challenge you you explain in your in your presentation is multi-challenge. Is a lot of things try to solve at the same time. In our world, not easy because uh, a lot of elements could, we can add in, in this equation. But I absolutely feel, uh, I feel um, we need to work together. Uh, congratulations for your presentation, and I feel and I hope to for the future continue in this relationship because I feel we need to solve a lot of questions together. In particular, and is my personal point, is in terms of the emissions. Evidently, you can work in the engine, you can work in your aerodynamic, of the, a lot of things. But, but, you explained today, be careful, our charge, our load for the trucks, change probably the load on the payment. And that means probably a new procedure, a new bituminous mixture design to be more adequate to this new track or this charge. Mm -hmm. For that, I, I, I am happy. Uh, thank you. If, if I may add, um, so um, I think we would all agree um, today 80% or so, I, I believe, of um, all freight, freight that is being transported over land is on road. 80%. Absolutely. Yeah. It, a lot can happen, many efforts can be made. Um, but it's very unlikely that this is going to change significantly, this figure. So again, if we are serious about, um, and we all are, about decarbonizing our economy, we must not leave out road. Um, um, and yeah. of course, um, uh, road infrastructure, we must, and that, that's why we, we, we also think the, the regulation uh, framework in general in Europe is in, print, in, in many elements heading in the right direction. But I fully agree with you that um, one of the elements, for example, is that it is, uh, there's a strong focus on, um, on heavy duty long haul, um, because this is where the, the emissions come from, the major, majority of the emissions. Um, um, it may seem easier, like a low hanging fruit or so, to decarbonize and electrify or, or um, cut the emissions um, of urban and regional delivery service. It's, it's all very important, um, but it will not solve the problem. Um, so that's why we, we need to tackle this um, uh, in the heavy duty long haul segment. Uh, and as you say, we all need to be serious about this. So um, if we do not adjust, um, for example, the weights and dimensions framework, uh, as I explained, um, um, 
then it will mean we will either not have the transition to zero emission technologies as quickly as we need it to have, uh, or um, it will just mean more vehicles on the road. Um, so, which is you choose, right? So. That's what I meant when I said there's a number of hard choices to be made and the choice has been made um, to decarbonize um, and to decarbonize also heavy duty road transport. Now, a consequence of this choice is vehicles will become heavier. Um, um, we have ways, we, redistributing the vehicle weight um, within the vehicle, um, which mitigates the problem, um, but it doesn't solve the 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 bottom line, which means um, we need um, more upgraded road infrastructure investments in order to ensure um, that the roads are capable of, of carrying and maintain properly, um, of um, uh, yeah, contributing to this um, uh, decarbonization effort. And I, I can only reiterate and echo what you said. It is not, uh, we need to stop um, the silo thinking. Um, it is beginning to happen um, in the economy with, between the companies. But we also need policymakers, of course, to recognize that this is a, a joint effort. Mm -hmm. Really, okay. I fully agree. Thank you. Thank you for this, this comment. Um, I'd like to give you some 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 uh, some some information about what we prepared in in EAPA in the recent years, because we are aware that one day we have to be adapted and. Uh, we have one of the documents, which is the classification and re of readiness of European highways for adopting connected, automated electrical vehicles. We were talking now at the moment about uh, about electric vehicles, but automated vehicles does also mean it's a different impact on the road surface, and also connected. So you can find more in this document. It's on the APA website, and we have even a, another one where we said, okay, when we have more heavy heavy vehicles. What does that mean for the road construction? And this is one of the documents, high performance asphalt pavements adapting for future road networks. Exactly what you mentioned, you will find some of the examples in here. So the industry is prepared, we can do that, we have the solutions, but you have to ask for it and you have to be sure that when you build a road today that should withstand climate change, which should withstand all this impact, you build it properly today because you will exactly. use it 20, 30, 40, 50 years. This is the goal, to be even more carbon neutral. It's a perpetual pavement. So this has to be considered from exactly. the engineers right now and also from those who give the money to build this infrastructure. <coughs> okay, I think it was a very nice and a very fruitful and very informative uh, first block of, the, of, the, of today. I thank you all again for the presentation. Thanks for coming to Brussels from Spain to the Spanish corner over there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd also thank you for coming to the, to the office. Maybe you should think of joining the, ro the European Road Maintenance Forum because this is open. It's not only the asphalt industry and uh, it should be all the stakeholders. So think, do the multi multiple stakeholder thinking, put it in place, make it re real. So you're welcome to join us in this. We will talk about this later uh, in the second block, a little bit more about the Road Maintenance Forum. But thank you so much for now. We will close the first block. So welcome back to the European Road Maintenance Forum 2024, which uh, is, takes place here in Brussels. Um, we come to the second session and I'm happy to welcome my colleague, <laughs> Technical Director of EAPA, Brescio Gomez. Uh, now we focus more on that what happens with the road. So more on the infrastructure itself, what the contribution of the pavement to decarbonize uh, road transport uh, is about. And uh, Brescia has prepared a presentation with uh, important points on this together with the colleagues from the French association, Route de France. So Brescia, we are curious about your presentation. The floor is yours. Great, so I'm happy that you're curious. Um, <laughs> So, oh, well, it came from the beginning. We need to pass all these slides again. I will go quick. No. One second. So, be careful now. Almost there? Yeah, almost there. So, yes. once again, Brescia, please, the floor is yours. Okay, so Karsten, in this presentation, the, the intention that we had is the, to put some figures to 
to support the idea of why we have to do maintenance, right? Because uh, this is a message that we have been sharing and that we do have to do maintenance, yes. But one thing is that we just say it. Another thing is that we do have figures that somehow support this, this kind of statements. So in this presentation, this is uh, together with the, the colleagues from Route de France, as you said, we try to put some, some numbers on, on the table. And to do this, uh, I would talk about these two uh, publications. The, the one in the left is a publication that EAPA, we published with EU, EU PAVE and FURL already in 2016. So it's a publication that is not new, it already has several years, but I would say that it's, it's sad that the messages still are valid today, right? And it's sad because still we have to, 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 to give the same, uh, the same message because the, the situation unfortunately didn't change, didn't change so much. So we will see that. And, uh, and also the other document is a, a document from Who's the France that, that the colleagues there published in 2021, so it's more recent, and uh, it's part of a study that I, I will show in a minute as well. So starting for, by the first document, um, already, uh, so this document is from 2016, but it has reference to previous studies from, for example, this one that I show from the Transportation Research Board uh, uh, that has a report from 2012, so even uh, older, where already in that time it showed scientifically and with, with tests that if we increase the surface roughness measured by the famous uh, uh, IRI, the International Roughness Index, but for, for every unit that we increase the, the IRI, we increase the, the, the consumption of heavy trucks 1% at normal speed of around 100 kilometers per hour and 2% if we do it at low speed, around 50, 60 kilometers per hour. So this uh, is very significant. And we can also do it in terms of uh, surface texture. So in this case, if we measure the mean profile depth, the MPD, for every millimeter that we increase the, 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 row the, the, the surface, we have a 1.5% increase at 88 kilometers per hour and 2% at 56 kilometers per hour. So for every unit that we, that we increase. Even older, uh, we have a report from 1999, so very old, where the Danish, uh, uh, there was a Danish report saying that if the budget for maintenance of the Dan Danish state road network is not sufficient, fuel consumption could increase by 3%. And this is something that they said more than 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And also from the 2000, very old, there is a study uh, on a test track in Nevada saying that uh, when trucks drive on the smooth pavements after rehabilitation, of these pavements, they consume 4.5 less fuels. So based on this and other considerations is how we reach this final conclusion in this document, where we says that when we pass from a surface that is in bad condition to a surface that is rehabilitated, there is a smooth, and, and, and so the vehicles circulating on this road consume up to 5% less uh, and, and uh, emit 5% uh, less of CO2 emissions. And a consequence of this is that if we just up created two-thirds of the European road network, this could save 28 million tons uh, of CO2, the, which is equivalent to uh, replacing six million cars by zero emission cars. So I would like to, I don't know, I, I don't know how I can highlight enough these, these figures because we are, if, if we think about the amount of engineering and research and development that a, a, a car manufacturer would need to do to, to just reduce 5% the, the the fuel consumption or the emissions in the car, that, that, that is uh, it's very difficult to that, the level of engineering uh, required for that. And we were saying that just by doing a proper maintenance of the roads, all the cars going there will reduce the consumption and the emissions 5% automatically. So this is, uh, I think it's uh, astonishing this, this impact and this is uh, one of the main reasons to, to do road maintenance. But still, we could wonder like, because we could say, okay, if we do the road maintenance, the emissions from the vehicles reduce, but what about the emissions that we need to produce to do the road maintenance itself? Is that more, is that less? Because maybe we are actually doing worse. And this is why, uh, this is exactly the topic of the second publication that I explained before from, from the colleagues of Route de France, which uh, that, that had a collaboration with the Puy de Tome uh, department. So um, basically, uh, if we see in this graph, that is very representative. Uh, this is the, let's say, the condition of a road or the performance of the road over the time. And we have two different maintenance approaches. The, if we see the one, the line in green on top, when the condition reduces a bit, we can do some 
small maintenance and go back up and then goes down again and then up. So a series of consecutive small maintenance operations could be preventative or reparative. Um, and the other strategy is to just do nothing and wait that the, the, the pavement is in very bad condition or even uh, reaching the end of life. And then in that moment, we need to do something but much bigger, uh, probably a full depth rehabilitation or something like that. And now the question is, what of these two strategies produce less CO2 emissions if, for example, we consider 50 years or something like that? And this is exactly what they, what they did. So I don't want to get into the, all the technicalities of all the calculations they did behind, but just believe me that what they did was a, a series of cases with different maintenance strategies depending on the, the, the layers they have on a road or, or what different operations they can do over time. And uh, they created different uh, scenarios for a given uh, surface area of a road of 10,000 uh, square uh, meters and for a, for a lifespan of 50 years. So I will present you here uh, one of the examples. So uh, on the table on top, we can see what was the maintenance operation with, let's say, small and frequent operations, while the one on below is like with less maintenance, but at the end, reaching the end of life before, so doing something a big uh, rehabilitation, let's say, with a reconstruction of the structure and everything. And in the graph, what you see is in blue is the, the small and frequent maintenance. So you can see that it goes up sooner and, and, and the steps go high. On the contrary, the orange one goes, does better in, in principle at the beginning. But because of this big uh, rehabilitation at the end, you can see that at, after the 50 years, the strategy of doing no maintenance or, or uh, less maintenance at the end uh, involved 21% the, the, uh, more emissions than doing maintenance more periodically. They repeated the same with other cases, with other types of layers, other types of uh, maintenance operations, and what they obtained is always that the, the, the frequent maintenance, the small maintenance, let's say, uh, save on emissions. So, for example, one case is uh, more like increase of 35% emissions when we do no maintenance and the other one is up even 93%, which is very high. So the next question is, okay, we know that doing small maintenance operation, more frequent at the end in the long run produces less emissions than if we don't do uh, frequent maintenance. But we also know that the time that we wait to do maintenance, the condition of the road is worse and worse and worse. And we saw before that the more IRI we have, the more roughness we have on the road, the more uh, consumption we have in the vehicle circulating there. So if we merge both things, this is when we come to this very interesting uh, graph. So in the bottom, you see what I just presented like a minute uh, ago. So the blue line is with uh, frequent maintenance and the red, the orange line is with uh, no maintenance, let's say, and we see that already the difference is 35%. For this case study that, that they did, 35% more if we don't do maintenance. But because the performance of the road also uh, goes lower if we don't do maintenance, all this time the vehicles are consuming more than with the green line on top. So we, when we do this calculation for the lifespan of 50 years, what we saw is that the, the consumption of the vehicles is 40% more than with uh, good maintenance. And this means that if we add 35% to this 40%, the difference of doing good maintenance or bad, ma bad maintenance is that when we do bad maintenance or no maintenance, uh, the, the CO2 emissions, the total CO2 emissions coming from this, uh, this road will be 75% uh, higher. 75% higher if we don't do proper maintenance. So with all this, we uh, reached some conclusions. First of all, that, okay, we knew already that doing maintenance is, uh, it, it, it was always recognized as the best way to preserve the integrity and the quality and the use of roads uh, to optimize the life cycle of the infrastructure. We need infrastructures that are resilient and that they are durable and, that we, and we knew that doing maintenance was good for that. So already we, we had some reasons. But now we know that if we do maintenance, regular maintenance, we will save on CO2 emissions in the long run from the point of view of the construction itself, from on-site uh, uh, operations and the asphalt manufacturers and uh, manufacturing and everything. And even if we do that, on top of that, we will also be saving a lot of uh, emissions from the vehicles. So 
to all these, these reasons that we have before, we know now that a, a proper and well-funded maintenance strategy for CO2 emissions reduction will require investment, it's true, but will also uh, additionally have a huge payback in terms of stimulating the economy, growth and jobs, fuel savings, reduce vehicle maintenance costs, as well as contributing to climate change mitigation, which is what we saw now. And for all these reasons, this is the final big conclusion is that we encourage member states and local and regional road authorities to embrace good road asset management <coughs> strategies based on adequate road maintenance and which consider the CO2 effect in the road maintenance plans. And Karsten, as I said before, this is a statement that was already in this publication for 2016 and I think it's still totally uh, valid and uh, we just have to repeat the same because unfortunately uh, this is where we are now. I would like to, before I finish this presentation, to remind that uh, uh, in, a, in a couple of months, and from 19 to 21st June, we will have the e, &E Congress, where we have already um, a program, it's already published, and we will have, for example, a session on um, the uh, low carbon emission, low carbon pavements, where we will talk about this, and of course we will talk about maintenance and, and all these things. So I encourage uh, not only the people here, but also the, the viewers online to, to come along and, and, and join for these interesting discussions. Leave here the contact for also from the colleague from Ruiz de France, uh, Brice de la Porte, who helped also to, to contribute to this, this presentation. Thank you, Brescio. Very good insights. So it's not new. No, we, we, no. we learned it's from 2016. And um, yeah, so not doing road maintenance is not an option. Definitely not. It, however you look at it, it's not an option. We have to do it. And uh, yeah, so you mentioned that there is the, that what the asphalt industry can do with the proper maintenance when we are asked to do it. So if we, are, if we have this proactive uh, road maintenance, then we can even save and it, um, CO2 emissions there too. But on top of, that, of it comes the, the, the deterioration in the IRI and the yep. surface uh, properties or the surface conditions. So smooth and even surfaces lead to low, roll, low, low rolling resistance and to less, CO, uh, to less uh, fuel consumption and less CO2 emissions. That's very simple. Right. So a new, paved, uh, a new paved road surface reduces CO2 emissions. Very easy. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So you also showed that if you don't do it, the IRI or the evenness and smoothness de deteriorates and that leads to higher CO2 emissions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this, this uh, do nothing scenario is not a, not a valid barrier, <laughs> scenario. Oh, yeah, basically there is not a scenario where do, we cannot do nothing. There is a scenario where do, we don't do nothing, we don't do anything now, but at the end we will have to do it at some yeah. point. And we will have to do something bigger with more CO2 emissions and what is worse, uh, over this time that we wait to do that, the, ca the, the cars will emit more. So there's absolutely no benefit of doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So th there's, a, there's also a, a even a, a second scenario to what, what we, we could even go beyond this because we talked about smooth and even roads. But what about if we have a tailor-made texture? So if we have a, an asphalt or a road surface which is tailor-made, to reduce CO2 emissions, to reduce, CO, uh, to reduce rolling resistance, uh, yeah. which is uh, related to each other. Um, the colleagues in Denmark, you also mentioned Den the Danish colleagues. The Danish colleagues have been looking into this since many, many years. Um, they also looked at the infrastructure and the road surface, the road surface conditions itself. And maybe you click the next, uh, the next slide. No, this is not <laughs> where we are. It's a climate-friendly asphalt. Yeah, here. Okay. So, this is the, uh, the climate-friendly asphalt that has been uh, developed in, in Denmark. Uh, the Danish government worked on this starting in 2011, uh, uh, funding a research project and to, 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 to really develop uh, this uh, climate-friendly asphalt. And I, I, I'd like to cite the, uh, at that time the, the Minister of Transport, Building and Housing, Ole Berg Olesen, and he said, the specially mixed asphalt will be very beneficial for citizens and companies who can expect to save a combined Danish Corona 40 million in fuel for each 1 million invested in new surface. So the factor is 40. That's what the Minister of Transport said. At the same time, the traffic noise will be reduced, etc., etc. By switching to climate-friendly asphalt, it seems we will be able to generate a strong effect with a relatively small investment. So that means that the colleagues and uh, 
I think I have another slide, another, another one. The next one? No, 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 no. This is the this is the presentation. So um, we also have a message on this, uh, emphasizing the, the 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 benefit for the society with uh, with this climate friendly asphalt from uh, the CEO of the Danish Asphalt Pavement Association, Anders Hundal, and he will he pre-recorded also a video for us today and. Maybe we show this one to get more insight about it. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Our climate is extremely important to all of us. Climate-friendly asphalt layer with low rolling resistance is a new Danish invention that could save 200,000 tons of CO2 per year in Denmark alone. Used all over Europe, it could save millions of tons of CO2. The Danish government has decided that this climate-friendly asphalt will be laid out on all state roads. The decision is a follow-up to a thorough and research-based report from the Danish Road Directorate. It states that the climate-friendly asphalt leads to less CO2 emission and less air pollution. This new type asphalt is moreover durable, noise reduction reducing and will soon pay for itself due to the societal benefits for the environment and for the climate. The new type of asphalt is a result of more than 10 years of research and development in a close cooperation between universities, authorities and asphalt companies. The recipe and pavement method for climate-friendly asphalt is not patented and everyone can use it freely. The role of the government is to decide to use climate-friendly asphalt. The role of the authorities is to demand it in all their tenders. And the role, the role of the companies is to be innovative and adapt to the new recipes and design methods. It's a matter of close and trusting public-private cooperation. Climate is so important to us all. We in the infrastructure sector can make a difference. We can contribute to the reduction of CO2. Thank you to the European Asphalt Pavement Association for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. And thank you for listening. So this was the CEO of uh, the Danish Asphalt Pavement Association, Anders Hundal, uh, showing the, the benefits, of the, so, the social benefits uh, for, an, for, a for a nation with uh, well-maintained roads. And uh, I can tell you that they, uh, Rainish, uh, the Danish uh, uh, National Road Authorities uh, have to apply this kind of asphalt, this climate-friendly asphalt, on, 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 on several uh, dedicated uh, road surfaces in the road network. Um, but Brescio, can you tell us from the technical point of view what, this, uh, what is the speciality about this climate-friendly asphalt? I think it is a, it, they call it also green SMA, stone mastic asphalt. Yeah, uh, okay, maybe without getting into too technical details, but uh, yes, these mixes that we call low road and resistance, uh, asphalt mixes uh, are mixes that have been developed based on what we call stone mastic asphalt. So first of all, these mixes have already a characteristic that is they are mixes very durable, very, very resistant even for heavy traffic and so. So this is already a, an environmental benefit uh, that will help to reduce uh, maintenance needs and that it will uh, last longer. So it's, uh, it, it's already sustainable itself. But uh, in addition to that, what these mixes do is that instead of creating a, a, a texture on the road to, at the end we need some texture to make sure that we have grip, we have uh, skid resistance, so we have ro safe roads, roads even when it's in wet conditions. So uh, other mixes do the, the, the roughness by having, let's say, peaks coming out of the roads. And these ones create the, the, this texture by having like holes getting inside. And this is what we call a negative texture that has the same texture but uh, but with low rolling resistance. So, and as a consequence of this, the, the vehicles consume less fuel, and as a consequence of that, 
re uh, produce less emissions. Also, sometimes, uh, I mean, we're talking a lot about CO2 emissions from engine car cars, but we could also say that electric cars will also have like an extended range because if they use that, because low rolling resistance means that electric cars can also go be lo longer distances with the same charge. And this is also sustainable, and we talked before about the, the electric cars. So, so it's a, a, another benefit that we can get with mm. this. Yeah. Uh, and low rolling resistance and uh, noise reduction yeah. go hand in hand, so you have also less uh, less noise on the road surface. And this is also a point we can, we can work on the road surface to, to avoid the, the, roll, the uh, high rolling resistance and avoid noise directly where it occurs on the surface of the road with a tailor-made road surface. Absolutely. So well-maintained roads on the one hand save up to five, six, seven percent of CO2 emissions and if we put a tailor-made asphalt on top of it, it's even, even more. more. Yeah. So there are possibilities for the National Road Authorities, definitely. Okay, so I would like to, to close this chapter a bit. We can, uh, in the panel uh, afterwards, discuss a little bit more about this. Mm -hmm. But to, 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 to get more uh, back to the idea of a road maintenance forum, which addresses the need for maintenance, for proper maintenance, not only in, in Europe, we have the example of the colleagues of South Africa. And I'm happy that uh, our colleague, the CEO of the uh, Southern African Asph Asphalt and Bitumen Association, <coughs> Phil Hendricks, gave us, uh, sent us a, a video. He will not be here with us because he has his road maintenance forum today in South Africa at the same time as we. So um, he will give us some insights about the idea, what they were talking about, what is the needs in South Africa. And um, by the way, I have to add, I mentioned before that in Madrid the roads are very, very, uh, in a good, very good condition. You would be surprised if you would see the South African roads. It's really impressive how good they are maintained and how the quality of these roads is. It's not always asphalt, but all the roads are in a good shape, mm -hmm. so in good condition. So let's listen to Phil Hendrick, CEO of Savita, what, uh, what he wants to, which, which messages he wants mm -hmm. to give us for Europe. Good afternoon to all the delegates at this workshop of the European Road Maintenance Forum. It is indeed a pleasure to be able to present and share some information with you on the South African Road Maintenance Forum, which started life on the 7th of April, 2022. I've got a fairly short presentation, and what I'll do is I'll focus on the background um, regarding the establishment of the Road Maintenance Forum in South Africa. Uh, how we started the forum, why, and uh, how we decide on things like typical agendas and uh, a little bit about some lessons that we've learned uh, from the past two years. So let's start with some background then to the South African Road Maintenance Forum and its beginnings. I'm sure you've heard similar cries in your countries, but in South Africa for a number of years, we've heard about potholes, potholes and potholes. We all have had the sense that we were on the brink of a massive imminent road failure um, and there were many of them to come. And of course, there were many reasons that were put forward for the sorry state we found ourselves in, including the funding issue, the lack of funding and uh, the resource capacity problem we were experiencing, particularly in the, in, the, in the public sector. And then, of course, issues such as systems breakdowns poor asset management systems, uh, no preventative maintenance procedures being followed, and then the difficulty of procurement in, in our country. Soon, of course, the private sector in all its forms was being roped in to assist uh, in fixing the country's roads. Uh, what you see here on the particular slide of the photograph is an internet uh, article in one of the business um, magazines in South Africa, a business tech, and this was written 2021 in May, and it indicated how private companies and individuals are now stepping in to fix our, our broken road sy uh, systems in, in the country. We have a Society of Asphalt Technology in South Africa, and it's celebrating 30 years uh, this year. It's a learned society of individuals in the asphalt sector, 
course, based in South Africa, but also it serves the interests of countries to the north of us, such as Lesotho, Eswatini, which is Swaziland, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Namibia. And in November 2021, um, members of the Society for Asphalt Technology started sharing a workshop document they compiled on routine road maintenance. And a month later, in December, a first planning group regarding the routine road maintenance workshop met. It was their first steering committee meeting, and they met further two months later, the beginning of the 7th of February, 2022. And Sabita assumed leadership of this particular committee and recommended the creation of a new body uh, forum, road maintenance forum uh, for South Africa. Late in February, 24th, 25th of February, uh, the government under the leadership of the Department of Transport held a road construction and maintenance in Daba uh, meeting. And really it, the idea there was to bring the roads industry and government together to develop a joint action plan and to look at what it could do in terms of implementation to fixing this, this crisis. And the idea really was to build consensus within the state to address the roads crisis in South Africa, but also to agree on plans regarding issues such as maintenance strategies, delivery models, etc. Meanwhile, Sabita had gone away after that meeting in February uh, with the steering committee. It had met the number of associations and institutions on this maintenance issue. And based on the success that we had experienced, um, we had a, a road pavements forum that's been in existence since 2000, it tells twice, twice a year, huge success in our country. And based on that, uh, we initiated and started the inaugural event on the 7th of April, 2022, the first road maintenance forum for South Africa. The date was deliberately chosen, of course, it coincided with International Road Maintenance Day. We wanted to align it with International Road Maintenance Day. I must say it was a huge success. We had about 331 delegates who attended, uh, 11 excellent presentations. And, uh, you know, it was a very successful joint initiative put together by the steering committee. And on the steering committee, some really powerful associations. We had our Society of Asphalt Technology, the Institute for Municipal Engineers, the South African Road Federation, Consulting Engineers South Africa, the CSR, which is our research institute, and then the South African Federation of Civil Engineering Contractors. So quite an august body from an association point of view. And look, at we presented the objectives um, of our road maintenance forum that were established, presented at the first event. And um, these were really the objectives, you know, to ensure that we have a platform for the exchange of information, to be able to provide opportunities to share best practice, to find solutions to challenges common to all of us operating in road maintenance, make sure we facilitate contact between the parties active in the space, and possibly identify research and development needs. Now, at one of the first road maintenance forum events, um, there was a really excellent presentation by a doyen in the roads industry. He had been operating for many years. He had led road authorities. He had worked in consultancy for a long time in Botswana, Mike Pienaard. And we'd asked Mike to present his views on what he'd seen in Africa on road maintenance. And Mike recommended that, look, it was time to reform, time to do a paradigm shift. And he put on the table that we had to understand that you know, this whole challenge and the issue of road maintenance is multidimensional. It's rooted in a number of factors, and those factors need to be addressed in a holistic, hierarchical, prioritized manner. And the factors that he mentioned, they're all interrelated, legal, regulatory, institutional, financial, planning and management, technical and operational. And... Um, Mike also indicated that, look, we're going to need and ensure that it will only work you know, if all of those factors are, are in sync, but also that we have sound government policy and we have political support for, for maintenance. 
he also thought that, look, the idea that we're going to re rely entirely on the future of state funding for maintenance is generally not a viable option, and we had to look at long-term long um, options. So then some of the reflections from Mike's presentation, he presented this road preservation permit. It had six key building blocks, political, external, institutional, financial, planning and management, technical and operational. And Mike's view was that only when those building blocks are acting in sync will it support the goal of sustainable road asset preservation. And then we also have the stable pyramid, of course. And really, this principle we've used quite extensively in establishing our agenda of all of our forum events. So just to give an idea, this was our second forum meeting in October 2022. Um, and you'll see, you know, a number of presentations in the agenda on systems, on materials, um, and, and touching on the technical issue. Um, whole issue around quality issues, quality assurance and control, uh, including product certification and then things like laboratory testing and, and, and training. So, you know, excellent keynote that we had from Mike that really gave us food for thought in how we put our agenda together for the road maintenance uh, forum events. The other thing that we've done as a rule is to reflect pretty quickly after each event you know, we question ourselves, do we pitch at the right levels? We still feel, feel there's a lot more room to look at this as more of a practical platform. It was the initial thinking, and we, we need to get a little bit more practical information to that platform. That's something we are looking at. Um, and we are looking at this complex issue. We ask ourselves, have we covered all the levels uh, at our session, or there's some that, that we've left out and we need to, to reconsider? We seem to have most of the technical tools and solutions and tools, but of course it's getting the politicians to the forum, ensuring there's political will to fix the problem. And then also ensuring we have enough technical information, training sessions to get the technical capability back into to our institutions in South Africa. But, you know, there's still many gaps within road, this road preservation permit and we need to deal with, with those issues. And it will keep us busy as a road maintenance forum for, for many, many, many years. The other thing I'd just like to share is that part of the success of our road pavements forum, which has been running since 2000, is that everything is run through a resolution approach. You know, we're driven by resolutions after every meeting, and we've done exactly the same with the road maintenance forum. So if you look at the text, these are the four resolutions that came out of our second forum. Um, we also are driven by work groups. And I must say, the work groups, members of industry put up their hand, uh, the experts, they participate, they give of their sweat equity. And it's common in forums such as the Road Maintenance Forum. I must also stress that the steering committee composition has been critical and they've added a lot of value because they have the, mem uh, the membership depth. And then, in conclusion, I trust that I've given you some useful information and background to the South African Road Maintenance Forum, the how and the why, uh, and some of the issues that have contributed to, to its success to date. I, I would just like to say from Sabita, its members, all of us here in the road industry in South Africa, uh, we'd like to wish the European Road Maintenance Forum only the best in its del deliberations and know it will be a huge success in the future. And I know it will contribute enormously to the future of road maintenance endeavors in Europe and, and elsewhere. Please note, you can go to the site and download uh, presentations uh, on our events that we've had in South Africa. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you to Phil Hendricks from Sabita to give us this, this, uh, this information about how they handled in South Africa. And I think there are a lot of takeaways for us, how we can we can steer the future of uh, our road maintenance forum Europe. Uh, this is something I would like to discuss a little bit more in a, in a round table now. And I'm happy to have two colleagues with us 
First of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Siobhan McKelvey. She is Director General of our, our uh, friend association, the Eurobitume. So welcome on stage. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, <laughs> and we have Ralf Pomp. He is the currently EAPA president. So welcome Thank on you stage. For the invitation. Yes, great to have you, to have you here. Um, and before we go more in the discussions of what we have heard in the, late, in the last, latest blog or during the day, uh, I'm happy to have Siobhan here because she can give us some more insight about the alarm survey that has just recently been published in the UK on the topic of road maintenance, road funding, and she will give us some maybe alarming figures <laughs> and maybe some more words. Um, this is a, 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 a report that has, that's prepared by MPA Asphalt, it's the Mineral Products Association Asphalt, which is EAPA member, and Eurobitume, they are the co-sponsors. So happy to have yes. you here as the, the, one of the co-sponsors to give us some yes. insights. What, what's the reality on roads and by the example of UK? Well, firstly, um, well, again, thank you for, for inviting me. Um, it's been a great afternoon and a lot of key messages there. But you've mentioned the alarm survey. And uh, just to qualify why I'm sort of maybe speaking about that, as, as Carsten said, it's, uh, it's part of an AIA uh, initiative, which is the Asphalt Industry Alliance, which is like an initiative, a campaign in the UK to really build awareness for road maintenance issues. Um, as Carson says, it's uh, ALARM stands for, if you haven't worked it out, Annual Local uh, Authority Road Maintenance Survey. And it's, as I said, it's done every year. Um, I have to say, I'm not directly involved at the moment, um, but I was in the very first one and it's now reached its 29th year in existence so it just goes to show that I think somebody mentioned earlier that there was uh, I think it was you Bratio a lot of the messages we're hearing aren't actually new in our industry we've always been uh, focused on looking for this the most optimum solutions sustainable solutions economic solutions so again um, the message from the uh, the alarm survey is, is probably not changed so much either over the last 25, 29 years. So, um, but I think the key thing to say, and you can read all about uh, the details, there's a very comprehensive report available through the website. You can download, you can get all the statistics. It it's, um, basically gives a snapshot of the road conditions in England and Wales. Uh, it, it includes uh, Roughly 70% of the local authorities take part. It wasn't like that at the beginning. It was a much lower uh, number, but it's grown a lot of momentum. And there's a reason for that, and I'll come back. Um, that's probably about 170 local, different local authorities. So that's really, you know, shows the correct credibility it has. And also, as I said, the need, the, the local, the voice of the local road authorities needs to be heard it's a stakeholder and uh, we've talked a little bit earlier today you mentioned about highways and motorways and the big the big roads around Madrid well you know all these lorries all these cars they don't stay on the motorways they have to come off and go go somewhere and that's what the local roads and that's um, really I think the success of the alarm and the success of the participation of the road authorities is very much they they need they were happy to have a platform to share their concerns about budgets, funding, the road conditions. Um, and I'm sorry, the, the messages haven't really been very positive. Um, and I think for the, for the uh, AIA, it's very much keep, keep repeating the message and keep that awareness in, you know, in the decision makers that there is a, a big problem, there's a big backlog. I think it quotes 16 billion pounds to actually um, make sure that it, to really address that backlog and it could take 10 to 15 years to even to even achieve that. And one another alarming thing that I, I thought about was somebody was mentioning uh, the carbon neutral, it was the uh, SAYA, um, Thomas, carbon neutral plans for 2040. And I was thinking that's 15 years from now. In the UK, the alarm survey is suggesting that 50% of the roads won't be fit for purpose in 15 years' time. So there's obviously a mismatch, I think, um, and I think you've 
maybe address that earlier, Carsten, that there's there's a lot of um, initiatives and um, focus. The focus currently is very much on carbon neutral, neutrality. But, you know, behind that, we still have existing that, um, that message, that challenge of maintaining the assets, the roads that we have, and the most sustainable way to do that is planned maintenance. So uh, you'll read a lot in the report. It's got a lot of the same argumentation uh, that we've heard from, I'm sure, from other uh, stakeholders. But I think um, the credibility of this now is, is uh, in the UK. It's, it's very high and it's used a lot by uh, local, local press and media to really highlight the problem to the general public. So um, it's not just about the potholes. We'd like to, we'd like to actually just get rid of that pothole debate totally by having proper, proper map planned maintenance and uh, sustained long-term funding, really. So that's very much about what the alarm's about. So um, I thank Carsten for letting me have the chance to highlight that today. But as I said, it's very much uh, my colleagues in the UK are very instrumental mm -hmm. in that. So. Yeah, yeah, they are doing it for almost 30 years now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So incredible. And this shows the, the other side, not the other side, so it shows, shows the downside. But we, we do so, it's so uh, clearly underfinanced, the road sector, that we start from minus at the moment. Mm -hmm. So to get, but we could, we could easily gain a lot of CO2 emissions reduction if the road authorities would take CO2 emissions reductions for really serious and do proper road maintenance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's a lot to gain for mm -hmm. all of us, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. I mean, there have been some you know, indications of, of increases in budgets, but with the, the cost of, of material and the cost of just general inflation, it, 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 it becomes nothing really. And uh, so that backlog will... <coughs> It's still the same, really, and, and increasing, which is a, which is a worry. You know, if, if there's something not not started soon, I think across Europe is probably a similar, maybe different degrees of um, severity. But if there's not some thinking about how do they plan align the the targets with carbon neutral and the targets with having the the assets there to to keep the countries moving, then I think uh, there could be big problem. <laughs> yeah, well said, thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we have our president with us and he was of course here for, 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 for the whole uh, presentation, the set of presentations. What is your, what is, what's your takeaway for today? What, is, what, what, what do you want to, how, what, what is your main yeah, takeaway and what would you like to emphasize and, and uh, what's your feelings about the, what you've heard today? Uh, I think it's always the same. It's all about making decisions. We've, we've had the information today that road maintenance is on one side CO2 reducing due to lack of uh, road, rolling resistance. We've seen that road maintenance in time also gives an additional redu reduction. But the main thing for me is that we have to tell it not only among each other, but to the taxpayers. Because at the end of the day, it's all a question of political decisions. And the, the, the main issue is that most people don't see that road maintenance at the end of the day is CO2 emission reducing. And so this is sustainability. And we can only get a change into that if we motivate the political decision to be other, because most of the people electing political uh, governments, they have never seen that the road of, of their home, the road that they use every day, has been built. It was there. So they think it is there from itself. But it has to be planned, it has to be funded, it has to be maintained, it has to be rebuilt. And I think we have to give the information to the people outside you have to ask for better roads so that the political decisions will be made to make better road maintenance and to keep it on a level which is on the proper way so that the goals that we want to achieve concerning CO2 emissions will be met at the end of the time. But I think that most of the people don't understand that and the most important thing is to send that information into the societies. And this is what I take from the day to day. It's not talking among us engineers, it's speaking to the public. 
to send that message, you have to ask for better roads. Because at the end of the day, it's a political decision. How much funding is put into road maintenance and into road construction? It's also a question of a negative image that our industry still has. Uh, many people don't see road maintenance and road work as something positive, which they should when they use the roads. Because we pave the roads for the users. And this is what we have to send to the people. Yeah, thank you, Ralf. That's that's what I would. I feel a little frustration, though. <laughs> but I, I think the whole our whole industry we're very proud of what we do. And yeah. the frustration is we have products, technology. We have the ambition to be sustainable. Always been like that. And um, the, one of the big hurdles is is in funding, isn't it? Investing. Yeah. So that's it. Mm. It's all about decisions. Decisions have to be made, mm. and it's the decision of the public. Mm. Yeah. The, the good thing, one of the highlights from the alarm itself is um, it gives information that can be used publicly because it's, it's connecting, as you say, the taxpayers with how their money's being spent or not spent in a wisely w wise way or the most optimum way. And I think what, once a year they get uh, some coverage, which is excellent, um, but without the, the survey itself and the time that the local authorities speak to, uh, or give the insight into the survey, um, you, there's no, no data there to, you know. So it's, uh, I'm sure there's other campaigns like that in other countries, but for be best practice, I mean, it's taken 20 plus years to really, to, to hit the BBC television kind of news nights, but, um, but it's not enough, as you say. It needs to be a constant reminder, and the public or the people, the users of the roads, need to be um, as passionate about it as the industry. <laughs> mm. So I'll leave that with you to think about. <laughs> and at the end of the day, it's also a question of safety. It's a question of noise, and mainly a question of road safety. Mm. Uh, I propose to uh, the chief redactor of a big German uh, newspaper, uh, Automotor and Sport, to make a comparison test uh, with the same car on the good road and on the bad road and to measure the difference of the braking way. And it's obviously that on the bad road <coughs> there will be a longer distance till the car will stop. But nobody talks about that. We should make the people see that. And safety is the main issue besides CO2 emissions. Mm. Yeah, but it's always a challenge to have uh, to have the different uh, properties of an asphalt surface have it, have them in the, in line. So uh, if you if you talk about braking, have a good uh, have a good friction, that is maybe not the um, it, it's contradictionary to any other properties. But at least a level a certain level of friction is always in the regulations. That's clear, and it's. I, I, can, I think I can agree with you. Yeah, I, I think it's no problem to find a bad maintained road <laughs> and to see that the braking distance is longer than on a new road. Mm. I see yeah. that you need a certain level of grip, everything okay, but we are talking about a very bad level, especially on city roads. Because the first thing that politic always cuts money off is road maintenance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And that's the problem. Mm. Austin, earlier you mentioned um, bringing in ASEA as a potential stakeholder or, or member of some kind of forum. Can you e yes. explain a little bit more about the concept? Yes, this is the, so the point why we have this, or the reason why we have this International Road Maintenance Day is to bring the awareness outside the industry, mm -hmm. to have an international day. And this is another start with the, Euro with the Road Maintenance Forum, the European Road Maintenance Forum, to bring strong partners into this it's a voluntary thing you can you, there's no membership fee included asefma and eapa started it but also other stakeholders should be part of it like asea like the uh, european road of Dire uh, directorate of Ro uh, no road directors association or the european road laboratories similar to that what the what uh, what phil uh, explained about the approach in south mm -hmm. africa so have a strong voice from different stakeholders, multi-stakeholder approach also in this road forum and this is something that we want to kickstart also today. So we organized it from the asphalt industry side but it's not only the asphalt industry, mm -hmm. it's the 
road industry and the road users. And then we have the possibility to even go more outside. Just imagine ASEA would, would comment on this, would publish this discussions that we have here. And I think Thomas was quite happy to be here to spread his messages too. So this is something, that, and that's for me a key takeaway or a call for action for our, ourselves to make it the road forum strong, have Eurobitum there, maybe the aggregates industry, have uh, the, the, the road users, and maybe public. Why don't we address the public? Mm -hmm. And some national road authorities maybe to support yeah. this. Yeah. So this is the idea. This is something I, should we work, I think we should work on in the next year. We will definitely have another International Road Maintenance Day in one year from now, and we should have a strong European road maintenance forum to organize it with a lot of nice key messages. And maybe we should also take the associations of the road users like the German ADAC with into the vote. In nearly every country there is a club like this mm -hmm. and these are the associations of those who use the roads mm -hmm. and they should ask for better roads. Well, we I'm sure when we get them into our boat that they will have the same ideas. Mm -hmm. We all know cyclists love asphalt. So <laughs> <laughs> Runners love yeah. asphalt. Runners and cyclists, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, true, true. Yeah, so what we, I think what we've seen today is that there are challenges from different angles on the road when it comes to road maintenance. We have the climate change. We did not touch that so much, but very, very, uh, uh, a little bit. The heavy duty vehicles, uh, the new road transport, so the new new vehicles on the road, and the mm -hmm. partly very low funding for for roads and road maintenance in in the last decades, we have a backlog even. <coughs> so this all leads to higher CO2 emissions at the end. And we also saw today that where the industry and not only the yeah the industry as a such, and if you look at people working with data, it's not the asphalt industry, but they help us. <laughs> so. The people or companies working in the field, associations working in the field, they have tools and they have solutions to fix this. Mm -hmm. And this is the good message, I think. So we can do, we can do proper road maintenance, but why don't we simply do it? Why don't they let us do it? Yeah? So this is the question I, I take away today. So uh, maybe we have, we can think about an, an other call for action. So I. You had one on your slide, Brescio, for the national road authorities to take CO2 emissions reductions for serious, to put it on their scorecard by proper road maintenance, for yes, example. So it's an action for them. Let's see if, um, if we can manage finally to get it. But uh, we will continue exchanging with them. And yeah. We are in good contact with them. That's a good thing. I, I, at least in the conversations we have, they are always on the same page with them. Of course, uh, well, sometimes mm. it's possible sometimes. Is, uh, we, we, are, we are in a moment now that uh, there, there is no excuse not to do it, right? Uh, we have all the policy pointing at decarbonizing, at reducing emissions. Our policymakers have put all huge sectors, like the automotive, we have seen that like changing completely the, the business model, like batteries, the, with the problems of the materials, the, the, all the infrastructure we heard, the, the, the charging points, everything. And we are saying that just by doing road maintenance we can have a massive impact on top of the impacts that we already knew uh, before. So there is absolutely no excuse, there is no reason not to do it. and So it has to happen. Yeah. I think this is almost the final word. Huh? That, was very, that, was, uh, that was very nice. So maybe I will, I will use this from Brescia to wrap up, give you some, some, last, uh, some last notes from my side. So, and we've seen that uh, some NRAs really do it. Look at Denmark, look at Denmark, look at, uh, look at the local authority in Madrid. So there are some, uh, some examples which show that it's possible. And we will see how that develops. So, so I think we are not just crazy. Some people are doing it, some countries are yeah, doing it, it's yeah. working. They, sh they are showing the way it's, it's working, so yeah. yeah. So I, I like to repeat, why don't we simply do it? We have all the tools, we can let, let us do it. Because it's not our decision at yeah. the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. That's so. the answer. We, yeah. we, we have to get those taxpayers into the boat. Reach the messages yeah. so to the right people. That yes. comes to my final words, which address, will address the European Road Maintenance Forum uh, and also the next International Road Maintenance Day. So it's time to say goodbye from Brussels. Uh, and we can say goodbye to the world because we had so many international <laughs> people here. Um, stay healthy and stay connected to EAPA and ASEFMA. 
to Eurobitume, to all the others that have been here, and especially to the International Road Maintenance Day. Five. And I'm sure we will have a European Road Maintenance Forum, a strong European Road Maintenance Forum that will prepare this day, and hopefully we get a larger outreach out of sight, outside of our industry to the public people, to the road users, the road owners, those who give the fundings. So thank you to all of my panelists today. To the, for the second panel, it was a big pleasure having you here. Thanks for your contributions. And the final word is bye-bye. See you latest next year in the next International Road Maintenance Day. Bye. <laughs>